She remembered that Gerald had left his keys lying carelessly on the sideboard downstairs. She fetched them and tried them one by one. The third key fitted the writing drawer. Alex pulled it open eagerly. There was a checkbook and a wallet well stuffed with notes and at the back of the drawer a packet of letters tied up with a piece of tape. Her breath coming unevenly, Alex untied the tape. Then a deep burning blush overspread her face and she dropped the letters back into the drawer, closing and relocking it. For the letters were her own, written to Gerald Martin before she married him. She turned now to the chest of drawers, more with the wish to feel that she had left nothing undone than from any expectation of finding what she sought. She was ashamed and almost convinced of the madness of her obsession. To her annoyance, none of the keys on Gerald's bunch fitted the drawer in question. Not to be defeated, Alex went into the other rooms and brought back a selection of keys with her. To her satisfaction, the key of the spare room wardrobe also fitted the chest of drawers. She unlocked the drawer and pulled it open. But there was nothing in it but a roll of newspaper clippings, already dirty and discoloured with age. Alex breathed a sigh of relief. Nevertheless, she glanced at the clippings, curious to know what subject had interested Gerald so much that he had taken the trouble to keep the dusty roll. They were nearly all American papers, dated some seven years ago, and dealing with the trial of the notorious swindler and bigamist, Charles Lemaitre. Lemaitre had been suspected of doing away with his women victims. A skeleton had been found beneath the floor of one of the houses he had rented, and most of the women he had married had never been heard of again. He had defended himself from the charge with consummate skill, aided by some of the best legal talent in the United States. The Scottish verdict of non-proven might perhaps have stated the case best. In its absence, he was found not guilty on the capital charge, though sentenced to a long term of imprisonment on the other charges preferred against him. Alex remembered the excitement caused by the case at the time, and also the sensation aroused by the escape of Lemaitre some three years later. He had never been recaptured. The personality of the man and his extraordinary power over women had been discussed at great length in the English papers at the time, together with an account of his excitability in court, his passionate protestations, and his occasional sudden physical collapses, due to the fact that he had a weak heart, though the ignorant accredited it to his dramatic powers. There was a picture of him in one of the clippings Alex held, and she studied it with some interest. A long-bearded, scholarly-looking gentleman. It reminded her of someone, but for the moment she could not tell who that someone was. She had never known Gerald take an interest in crime and famous trials, though she knew that it was a hobby with many men. Who was it the face reminded her of? Suddenly, with a shock, she realised that it was Gerald himself. The eyes and brow bore a strong resemblance to him. Perhaps he had kept the cutting for that reason. Her eyes went on to the paragraph beside the picture. Certain dates, it seemed, had been entered in the accused's pocketbook, and it was contended that these were dates when he had done away with his victims. Then a woman gave evidence and identified the prisoner positively by the fact that he had a mole on his left wrist, just below the palm of the left hand. Alex dropped the papers from a nerveless hand and swayed as she stood. On his left wrist, just below the palm, Gerald had a small scar. The room whirled round her. Afterward, it struck her as strange that she should have leapt at once to such absolute certainty. Gerald Martin was Charles Lemaitre. She knew it and accepted it in a flash. Disjointed fragments whirled through her brain like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle fitting into place. The money paid for the house, her money, her money only. The bearer bonds she had entrusted to his keeping. Even her dream appeared in its true significance. Deep down in her, her subconscious self had always feared Gerald Martin and wished to escape from him. And it was to Dick Windiford this self of hers had looked for help. That too was why she was able to accept the truth so easily, without doubt or hesitation. She was to have been another of Lemaitre's victims. Very soon, perhaps. A half cry escaped her as she remembered something. Wednesday, 9 p.m. The cellar with the flagstones that were so easily raised. 
Once before, he had buried one of his victims in a cellar. It had been all planned for Wednesday night. But to write it down beforehand in that methodical manner, insanity. No, it was logical. Gerald always made a memorandum of his engagements. Murder was to him a business proposition like any other. But what had saved her? What could possibly have saved her? Had he relented at the last minute? No. In a flash the answer came to her. Old George. She understood now her husband's uncontrollable anger. Doubtless he had paved the way by telling everyone he met that they were going to London the next day. Then George had come to work unexpectedly, had mentioned London to her, and she had contradicted the story. Too risky to do away with her that night, with old George repeating that conversation. But what an escape! If she had not happened to mention that trivial matter... Alex shuddered 